Uh, Sir Cliff, if we can start with you. Good to see you. Thank you very much for being with us. And this is a campaign to change the law to provide anonymity. Just give people watching a sense of the impact you being named had on your life. Well, it could have destroyed me, I suppose, because, in fact, it was such a, a shock to be sort of suddenly wake up and find this has happened, especially seeing it on television before I'd even known what was happening at all. I found out later when I saw the TV show afterwards that they'd broken into the apartment and there'd been this like, accusation. And I can't tell you, it's hard to describe. When you're not guilty of something, it's, you just feel it's not true. It can't be true. And then slowly, as the days go by, you know the accusation was made. And it just, it was... Um, uh, the most horrible time. And it took four years before I absolutely, completely finished it. And it wasn't until after I had won my case with the BBC that I actually felt this was the end of that episode of my life. I'm past it, but I'll, I'll probably never get over it. it I, I guess I about it at least two or three times a week, maybe, just in passing sometimes. But it's, it's, a, it's a part of my life that I'm thinking, I didn't deserve this, I did nothing wrong. And somebody who did accuse me will never, will never know who he is. And once you were identified, what did you feel? Did you feel that you were, you know, guilty in the court of public opinion or guilty in the media, that there's no smoke without fire? I mean, what was your, you know, your feeling about that? Well, that was the danger. When, of course I thought to myself, oh my, some people are going to believe this, you know. I have to be strong. When I went to bed at night, I knew that... I was innocent, my accuser must have known I didn't do it, and God knew I didn't do it. So I survived thinking about those areas all the time. And the first thing I did, though, that really relieved me, I found myself hating this person, not knowing who he was. And I, I remember waking up one night, it was always at 3.15, I don't know why, 3.15, and I said, God, I want to forgive him. I don't know how to do it, but I'm just going to say now, I forgive this guy, he probably has a reason for doing it. And as soon as I released that, I found myself more, not exactly comfortable, but it became a little bit easier to decide. I didn't think I could go on hating someone like this. It was really, a, that was bad for me. And so to get it off my chest, I just forgave him. And the thing is, of course, unless he's watching this show, um, he probably never knows that I'll, I forgave him. And, Paul, you spent a year on bail, I think, uh, before your case was dropped. What, what was life like for you during that time? It was a, a completely different existence from what I had lived before and uh, since I have lived after that. Uh, because what it was was that uh, I was shunned from many organisations which I helped to found or fund. And also, of course, uh, I was immediately dropped by the BBC from working. So I lost about £100,000 in earnings at exactly the moment when I needed money to pay legal bills. So it got a bit tense. But fortunately, I had a very loyal and supportive husband, Christopher, and my close friends stayed with me. My family in America stayed with me. And we just had to see it through. We just had to survive it. Get up every day, as Nigel Evans, who was also falsely accused, said, every morning you woke up and it was like being hit by the same truck. Uh, for about two seconds, you would not realize that this was happening, and then it would hit you. And I was really glad, and I'm going to say this, that I was able to be of help to Cliff, because I went first. And then our cases overlapped, and then mine was over, and his kept going until it ended. And a couple of times he would say to me, I'm experiencing this. What does it mean? And uh, you'll remember the one time when you said to me, I'm afraid I'm losing my mind. Because I was talking to myself. You know, and I said, no, you're a professional and you're rehearsing in case you ever had to go before a judge. <laughs> yes. And you thought, oh, yeah, I'm rehearsing. Uh, and uh, then when I thankfully was able to lead uh, the effort for a law reform, which was the bail reform, you said to me, I'm inspired. You've had a law reform. I want a law reform. And what I want is anonymity before yeah. charge.
Yeah. Right. And, um, and so, Daniel, your father was caught up in sexual abuse allegations that were never tested, I think I'm right in saying, in court um, because of illness and so forth. Um, why do you think it's so important that this should be enshrined in law now? Well, <clears throat> Mark, his case was a classic case because the Leicester police um, advertised the fact of his uh, flat being searched, the papers put in photographs, and it was like flypaper to false accusers to come forward and make false allegations, which they were. And in his case, it was about civil uh, proceedings, and uh, he was sued and then the estate was sued, and every single one of those civil actions collapsed because it was total rubbish. And we, as a family, and he would never have gone through the agony that he did if the law was as we are proposing. And what we are proposing is a, a fairness, a balance, so that the uh, complainant rightly has anonymity, as it happens for life. We're saying that the innocent suspect, or the person who may well be innocent for that matter, has protection uh, until such time as he or she is charged. And that strikes us as being the fair balance. And we had mm. uh, a meeting today in the House of Lords. Um, a, a number of very important parliamentarians were there. Sir Cliff spoke beautifully, as did Paul. And I think uh, they were um, persuaded. And I think we're going to get this legislation through. It's a small change, it's a fair change, and it should happen. Right, Sir Cliff, I mean, is the plan that this law applies to not only the police, but to journalists and to, to, to everyone in a way, um, I just wonder how realistic you think it is with social media. You know, a famous person is arrested or their home is searched by dozens of police. Someone somewhere is going to have a camera and is going to put it on social media. Is it, is it realistic, this anonymity? I just wonder. If we get what we want, and, and look, it's a compromise. Um, you know, I, I don't know what happened to King John at Magna Carta. Where, who changed the rules? He said that every single one of us in this nation is innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law. And so suddenly we're having to face the fact that, oh, no, your name can be plastered all over the place. It took... I asked a friend of mine, how long do you think it took to get to all the countries I've been to, from New Zealand, Australia, Southeast Asia, all over Europe? She said, my dear, about 10 seconds. And I'm thinking, oh, my... So... And I had to deal with the fact that many people would have perhaps thought there was no smoke without fire, and yet, as a rock star, I know there's no smoke without fire. We don't need a fire to make smoke on stage. So it was one of those things that was frustrating for me. And so, therefore, you know, if we could trust the media completely and 100%, normally, for instance, now, we're on television. People who are watching are listening to what we say. You can't edit it. It's going out live. I love that. Sometimes you can do an interview and they'll leave out a comma or a full, step, a full, full, full stop and it sounds like you've said something else. Yeah. So I think that a law would force them to say, we're not allowed to name him until he or she is charged. And that makes sense to me. Once you're charged, it means the police think they have enough evidence to take you to court. Now, in court, you could be found innocent or you could be found guilty. Mark, yeah. can, I make, can I make a couple of points? Well, can I just ask you a question, maybe? Because yeah. I'm interested, because the, uh, is there ever, Daniel or Paul, is there ever a legitimate policing reason for... Yeah naming suspects, because the police, are, you know, have this guy... They, they would argue that, you know, in some cases it would encourage other complainants, not victims, as you say, complainants to come forward to make their case. So is there ever a case? Um, and that's what, just what I wanted to come in and say, because within this proposal, within this proposed legislation, is a provision for a, the police uh, or the press, for that matter, in certain cases, such as the War Boys case, by way of example, to have the restriction lifted in certain restricted circumstances. C can I just more add one point? Well, this campaign is not only about uh, the well-known people. This whole campaign is about uh, protection for everybody. Because I suppose some people would say, well, look, there's a public interest argument, Paul, that, you know, there's a transparency argument. Is that at all a factor, do you think? Or do you think your, 
right to, or to whoever's right to anonymity um, overweighs or outweighs that, you know, the, 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 um, the stigmatization. Well, the basic tenet of British justice, innocent until proven guilty, uh, it, it shows us that uh, you should not be assumed to be guilty, uh, and particularly uh, until the CPS believes there's a better than 50% chance of your conviction, in which case you become charged. Now, it's very important that there is this element in the bill, which Daniel has mentioned, which is that if a judge or magistrate believes that the suspect is a threat in the current moment, as John Warboys was, then that person can be named. But in most cases where the accusation concerns something that happened years ago, there's no rush. If you believe the police are professional, give them the chance to do their job to build a case until a charge is justified. This is an area where the spectrum runs from 100% accurate accusations to 100% false accusations. And we have to be able to hold more than one idea in our head at the same time. Many genuine victims of abuse want to come forward or should feel the confidence to come forward. But we also must acknowledge many accusations are false, either because the person is what I politely call distressed or is a fantasist or has a grudge. And for those who wish that everybody could come forward and name names, I have to say I've studied all these cases and yeah. I've discovered that many of the people who come forward are, for some reason or not, not speaking truth. And right. I can say just this, finally, let me just, just say this, before you ask your next question, the, the idea of the public's interest. I don't think it was in the public interest to have a helicopter outside my apartment showing the police rummaging around my underwear and stuff. I don't think that works, it doesn't work. So that's not an argument that we need to deal with, I don't think. And right. also, I read in a newspaper once that the people are very interested on David, what's his name, the footballer, his underwear colour, but should they know the colour of his underwear? Yeah. No. So, look, just finally, Sir Cliff, yep. you suggested at the beginning that this, you know, harmed your mental health, basically, quite severely. I mean, how bad did it get? It got... I was never suicidal, but there were a number of times when I would wake up, and funnily enough, I, I, for some reason, it was always 3.15 when I woke up, and it was most nights. And sometimes I'd wake up with every pulse in my body thumping, and I didn't feel suicidal at all, but I kept waking up thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to die of a heart attack. And it could only have been brought... That, that position in my bed like that could only have been brought on by knowing that I was totally innocent and yet being dragged through all the p papers, although the papers were generally very much in my favour. The BBC should never have done that. They should never, ever have done that.